please rise as you are able in body or spirit and join us in our responsive call to worship. Come rest your spirits in the Lord. We come hungering and thirsting for God's word. This is a place of peace and hope where all may be fed and healed. In the midst of our hectic lives, we surely need such a place as this. Bring us to the time of healing. Let the demands of your week melt away in God's presence. Our souls long for God's refreshing love. Revive and restore us, O God, to hear your word and feel your presence. Our opening hymn is the bulb there is a flower. In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it sees on something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death. At the last of victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Trusting God's word and claiming God's power, let us first confess the ways in which we have fallen short, first in silent prayer. Let us pray. David loved Jonathan, yet he wore the uniform of Jonathan's killer. David danced for joy in the streets, while Michael bore witness to his drunken excess. David's power and status grew, as did his scorn of the blind and the lame. David wanted to build a temple, thus proving his devotion. David built a legacy of broken lives, thus proving his culpability. We are David, mourning the loss of our love and our innocence. We are David, guilty of exploiting those entrusted to our care. We are David, unexpected hero and unrepentant scoundrel. We are David, we belong to God. My friends, God is not done with us, not by a long shot. You are more beloved than you can ever know and God is working in you and in the world beyond our wildest imagining. Receive God's forgiveness and walk in God's love. How then are we called to live? The Lord Jesus Christ said, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets.
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Good morning, church. I'm Adrian Thorne, the senior minister of the First Presbyterian Church of Brooklyn, bringing you greetings from Brooklyn, one of the amazing boroughs in New York City. That Romans 8 passage is such a comfort today in the midst of these tumultuous times, times that seek to separate us from God and from one another, but those times will not succeed. It is a joy to be gathered with you in faithful community this morning to carry together the joys and the sorrows of our own lives and the tears and laughter of the world We're so glad to welcome you to worship this morning and to hold with you anything that is grieving your heart. Because we record worship in advance, it is possible that something has happened in your life or in our world that we will fail to mention or acknowledge this morning. If that is the case for you, we are making space at this time for you to share with us in the chat so that we can join our prayers with yours. So whether you're joining us at firstchurchbrooklyn.org or on our Facebook page, please, at this time, share with our community. May God comfort God's people and be ever near to the brokenhearted. Amen. Following worship, please join me for a brief sermon talkback on Zoom. This is a brave space that I attempt to hold every Sunday that I'm able, giving us a chance to reflect on faith, race, and anything that comes up for us in worship. Join me on Zoom with meeting ID number 812-9262. 6196. You may join these conversations also dialing in using your phone. The Zoom phone number is 929-205-6099. Once you have connected, enter the meeting ID number, which again is 812-9262-6196. I look forward to welcoming many of you after worship for what is proving to be really wonderful, um, insightful conversations. Please check the church calendar for a list of upcoming events and ways to connect with our faith community. On Mondays, I do a 30-minute meetup at 12 noon via Zoom. On Wednesday mornings, the men meet virtually for breakfast and wonderful conversation. And in the evenings on Wednesday, Reverend April hosts our Bible study at 7.30 p.m. Our young adults meet the second Thursday of every month. And there is an in-person meetup at the church in our Peace Garden on Saturday afternoons from 4 to 5 p.m. There are a plethora of events weekly and monthly for our children, youth, and families. Please, again, check the church calendar on our website for details on ways to connect and to continue growing in your faith. Finally, I want to invite you to keep an eye out for our post-election plan for connection. We're all working very hard to get out the vote and to make voting plans. And we also need to have something in place for the evening of election day and the days beyond when our work for love and justice continues. We are planning a prayer and poetry evening on November 3rd. A watch party with Odyssey Impact on that Friday, looking at uh, prison and mass incarceration. There will be part two of our all-church book conversation with Isabella Wilkerson's acclaimed book, Cast, and plans to join the Blanton Peel Institute for their annual Norman Vincent Peel Awards for Positive Thinking. It will be a wonderful week of care and comfort in the aftermath of the presidential election. So more soon, and I hope you will make plans to join us.
Today we have the good treat and the good fortune of having my friend and my brother, Masia Evans, in the pulpit. Masia and I attended seminary together, and his family is my family. He and his wife, Kawami, kept a room in their home for me when we were in grad school so that when I would visit, I would have a place to be, uh, a place to be, a place to relax. They've been incredibly generous with their love and support, and I'm grateful for that ongoing support today as Masia takes the pulpit. Masia has been in ministry since 2007. He completed his Doctor of Ministry from the Claremont School of Theology this spring. He teaches part-time at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley and shares with us today. We're really fortunate and in um, have, have a treat in store for us, his love of spoken word. He brings new approaches to the church and its surrounding community he was the youth pastor at St. Mark's Methodist Church in Sacramento, and he currently serves as pastor of Roseville United Methodist Church, where he has been called since November 2019. Please pray with me for my brother, Masia, as he brings the word this morning. Pray also for his amazing family and his congregation, who is loaning him to us with joy and great delight this morning. Passing the peace is a tradition rooted in scripture that embodies our identity as peacemakers and trains our hearts, hands, and tongues in the way of peace. From the beginning, by regularly practicing this gesture, our hearts are shaped in the form of the words that we speak. Christians have exercised this practice, and I invite you now to join our long tradition by placing hands on your heart and wishing yourself God's peace or sharing a sign of God's peace with your neighbor. Words, hugs, and handshakes. May the peace of Christ be yours this morning and forevermore. I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind.
Good morning, First Church. It's Nate Dudley representing the Churchwide Nominating Committee. We're recruiting elders for next year's session to be on our new slate. If you're interested, please send a note of interest to Annie at the church office at info at firstchurchbrooklyn.org. Or you can send interest to any of us on the committee, Pastor Adrian or Barbara, Edna, Harriet, Ashley, Zach, or me. Thank you for your interest. The Hebrew Bible reading today is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod, such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our new Christian Testament reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will get, give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. change the world with my own two hands make it a better place with my own two hands make it a kinder place with my own two hands with my own with my own I can make peace on earth with my own two hands. I can clean up the earth with my own two hands. I can reach out to you with my own two hands, with my own, with my own. 
two hands with my own with my own two hands I'm gonna make it a brighter place with my own two hands I'm gonna make it a safer place with my own two hands I'm gonna help the human race with my own two hands with my own with my own two hands with my own with my own two hands I can hold you in my own two hands and I can comfort you with my own two hands but you've got to use use your own two hands use your own use your own two hands use your own use your own Good morning and peace to you. My name is Reverend Dr. Masia Evans and I am the pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Roseville, California. I send you greetings from our community who will also be joining us for this video. I am deeply grateful for my alum mate, my colleague, my sister, and my forever friend, Reverend Adrian Thorne for this opportunity. And I am also grateful to you. To be honest, I've been lurking on First Church of Brooklyn's website and on your Facebook page and allowing myself the pleasure to get to know your community through the resources, through conversation and through videos. And because of this, it is indeed an honor to come before you this Sunday, for I celebrate not only your deep traditions and history, but the fact that it is quite evident that you are truly living into your mission to be an intentionally inclusive and diverse Christian community committed to serving God in our world. I also celebrate the fact that even in the midst of all the frantic and maddening stuff happening in this world, this is still the day that God has made and prepared for us to share. Therefore, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and let us be glad in it from coast to coast, from Cali to NY. Now I know that my bio is provided, so I don't have to get into a full introductions. However, I will say this, I delight in entering into this virtual pulpit because I'm an East Coast cat through and through. My people are from Maryland, DC area, and I was raised up North in Hartford, Connecticut but my whole life is situated up and down that I-95 corridor. And I made some meaningful memories as a kid in that baseball cathedral right north of you in the borough of the Bronx where the players with pinstripes play. So I say go Yanks. So though not raised in the city, the East Coast is home. My heart is there. And as someone who is getting ready to enter into my 16th year of non-winters and non-cold and non-snow on the west side underneath the rays of the California sun, I must say that though my heart is on the East Coast, my body shall remain happily right here. Praise the Lord. So... Last week, 
our sister Saram Kang spoke to the persistence of Hannah's prayers of supplication and prayers of thanksgiving, proclaiming God's sovereignty and faithfulness. Indeed, there is none like you. And believe me, you don't want to hear me sing. That would be so wrong, like, you know, the joke that our sister said. But what would be so right is to travel just one book ahead into the second Samuel chapter 7 and explore how King David's request to build a house or a temple and the prophet Nathan's response to that request has relevance for us some 3,000 years later. Now, this would be the time when I would insert some corny pastor slash dad genre joke that will make my 13-year-old daughter squirm or just want to disappear like Violet from The Incredibles. Some corny joke like, why was Goliath so surprised when David hit him with the slingshot? Answer, the thought had never entered his head before. And of course, the follow-up joke in question is, if Goliath came back to life today, would you tell him that joke? Answer, no, he already fell for it once. So, though I like that joke, we're not going to go there today. What we are going to do before we get into our message is have a word of prayer. Dear God, with gratitude we affirm that you are a living God and that in you we live and move and have our being. We open our hearts to receive that which you have for us to receive. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, just to give quick context to our scriptures, David has risen to the throne. He has fought this bitter fight with Saul, and now he's in the process of consolidating his power in his newly captured city of Jerusalem, which was taken from the Jebusites. In chapter 6, we have this dramatic scene of the Ark of Covenant being brought into the city, and we have this incredible sight of the king, the conquering king, not mounted upon a horse, but stripped down to just this little linen ephod and dancing and leaping before the Lord with no care about how he was perceived, even saying, in effect, I don't care what y'all critics say. When it comes to honoring the Lord, I don't mind being undignified. The people who will get it will get it. That's my paraphrase. And I must say, there are few people in this world more amazing than dancers. Be sure to give them love, especially if those dancers just so happen to be pastors. And then we get our reading for today in chapter 7. And it is described as one of the most important passages in the Hebrew Bible. Most scholars agree it was a Deuteronomistic redaction or addition to the narrative that sought to historically explain or reinforce God's covenant or promise to God's people. This chapter is also read during Advent because it is frequently referenced in later writings and of course in the Christian Gospels as a basis for a messianic hope. This hope rooted in the restoration and perpetuity of the Davidic kingship and dynasty became especially important to the Jewish people after the trauma incurred by the Babylonians conquering Judah in the 6th century BC. And despite the later conquests and oppressions, there was always hope in being able to read and affirm God's promise that said, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, just a little inside baseball at this point. As a preacher, I can go in many directions. Now, most tend to go towards how Jesus becomes this vessel 
of this messianic hope legitimized by being proclaimed as the son of David destined to be the deliverer. But my initial instinct was to talk about Nathan. I mean, just to remind you, the scripture says, the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him. You know, as I read this, I almost imagined a Game of Thrones scene. David in his red keep equivalent, sitting on the iron throne, smelted from the metal swords of those he vanquished. The company of advisors are gone in this great hall. The fawning townsfolk have left. The king's guards have been sent away and he is left there with his trusted advisor, the prophet, a type of hand to the king, this guy named Nathan. And he says to him, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. I am going to build a house for the Lord. And of course, Nathan replies, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord will be with you. So there's a sermon to be delivered about how the proximity to power can pervert our prophetic word. But that's for another time. What kept coming back to me in this moment was this idea of house. It hit me as if I was doing a, a Lectio Divina, almost in a meditative state, just house. And this, this word house is scattered all throughout this pericope, including within the oracle or the thus saith the Lord that Nathan receives that night by God. In fact, it's almost this poetic play on words Palace and temple were often associated in the ancient Near East, and the same Hebrew word is used for both. David worries that his bayeth, or his house of cedar, is grander than the tent shrine of the Lord. So he asks, should I make a house for God? Further, this double sense of house comes to bear because God may not build, David might not build a house for God, that's for Solomon later, but God will build a house, i.e. dynasty, for David that will last forever. House David, if we continue with the GOT themes. So this evocation of the word house in this text got me thinking, what kind of house is needed for today? This question was amplified as I reread God's initial response to David's request. Listen to it again. It says, are you the one to build me a house to dwell? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. And I now paraphrase, paraphrase it says, when did I ask you to build me a house of cedar? God almost takes his incredulous tone. Don't you know that I am beyond this? Don't you know that my presence is not dependent on a specific place or house? But we see what happens with David's request in this general instinct to make a house for God and how that kind of morphed over time into making a house of God. So we move in our scriptures from having the high places and altars like the one in Shiloh that Hannah prayed at and the temple that David's son Solomon ultimately built and was later destroyed by the Babylonians. Then we have the Ezra Nehemiah building the second temple, which was expanded by Herod and later destroyed in 70 AD. Later, we have the house-like churches in the early Christian era and the basilicas and cathedrals after Constantine, and the churches that we have inherited in this post-Reformation era has become this representations of the house of God that has become normative and almost ubiquitous, and is usually understood to be the place where one encounters the sacred. But what kind of house is needed today? So my doctoral work was on 
spoken word and the creation of sacred space through ritual performance and imaginative theologies. In it, I address what sacred space means. In Western traditions, the sacred is usually defined as those compartmentalized encounters with the transcendent that is set apart from that which is deemed as secular. In contrast, within an African-based cosmology, which undergirded black folk religious traditions, notions of the sacred and the secular were a lot more fluid, guiding an understanding that God can be found everywhere. So every place and everything is sacred. Or as my poet friend once said, there is no spot where God is not. Or as God says to David through the prophet, I have never dwelt in one particular house. I've always moved where you have moved. So what does this mean for the kind of house that is needed for today, the place of sacred encounter? Well, I believe that black folk religious traditions may hold a key, especially when slavery was legal in the antebellum South. Because the set apart houses of God were reinforcing notions of white supremacy, i.e. you have to be a good slave or your reward is in heaven. Black folks had to creatively form alternative spaces or houses of sacred encounter. And what made a space sacred was not its delineations or the date that was inscribed in its cornerstones or on its plaques, but whether or not there were rituals and practices of resistance and healing and flourishing that was happening in that space. For my ancestors, a house of sacred encounter was seized in those steal away places of forest clearings and sometimes in the midnight hours underneath the witness of stars. Sometimes a house of sacred encounter was created even under the threat of death by assembling branches just so as to create hidden hush arbors to pray and to worship and to whisper and to dance. A house of sacred encounter was made in clandestine ways in an abandoned tobacco farm or barn or a shallow hole or even a slave cabin on the outskirts of the plantation as they gathered with naught but an overturned pot for protection and a deep faith in a God who makes ways out of no ways. So what kind of house is needed today? So yes, this creative house making of sacred encounter within black folk religious traditions continued in formal church settings. In fact, I remember how my grandmother's folks gathered in that seemingly ancient Methodist church in the country parts of Maryland with memories of that sun bleached, whitewashed, barely holding on to that wooden structure down road in the Hall Creek lowlands in Calvert County. But you see, when it comes to house making today, it is good to still remember that whether inside or outside the church, there is still no spot where God is not. And to remember that the act of sacred house making occurred even in unlikely places. Places like the juke joints where the blues fed the soul just as much as gospel. God was found in Miles' muted horn as well as in Billie Holiday's haunting voice. God was found in the graceful movements of the Nicholas brothers and also on the prolific tip of Sonia Sanchez's pen. God was found in the elegance of Misty Copeland's pirouettes, Mae Jamison's cosmic curiosities, and Zora Neale Hurston's incredible swag that had our eyes watching God, the same God found in the resilience radiating from freedom workers like Ida B. Wells or Alicia Garza. God was found in the spice of Jamaican patties and roti sold on the corner in my friend's abuelita Sancocho. God was found in the houses of the New Yorkian Poets Cafe 
And even Brooklyn Moon back in the day, where poets became prophets and preachers who mounted stages like pulpits, delivering poems like sermons. All these folks, all of these housemakers were animated by a living and transformative tradition that created spaces of sacred encounters, encounters that often went beyond the four walls of the church. So the question set before us today is, what kind of house is needed today? Let me suggest that the kind of sacred housemaking needed is not about constructing more temples of cedar, but it's about midwifing dynamic tent-like spaces that can creatively move and respond and speak to, as Howard Thurman said in the opening lines of Jesus and the Disinherited, those in our society whose backs are up against the wall, those hurting while hurled about in a sense of hopelessness, especially during this time of unease and record unemployment, this time of disease and of death, this time characterized by racial conflict and the hovering specters of forced modern day martyrs like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, in a time of toxic politics and gun violence and armed militias and domestic terrorists, in a time complex and troubling, menaced by the storm clouds of separation and just cynicism and division and distrust, the fomenting of fear, the angst and anxiety, the unmitigated hate that is just spewing forth in bucketfuls of bad news on our TV or on our social media feeds while dealing with the impact of COVID-19 and knowing, knowing that behind the scrolling statistics, there are souls and knowing that behind all the numbers, now over 220,000, there are names and there are families and there is pain. So what kind of house is needed today? Quickly, may I suggest the kind of house that is needed are the ones guided by Jesus's life-affirming, God-glorifying, agony-eradicating ministry. It is standing up for those in our society whose lives have not mattered. It is confronting systems of oppression, voting our values, holding our leaders accountable, and indeed, as John Lewis said, making some good trouble when necessary. May I suggest that the kind of house that is needed are creative and art inspired and filled by people who don't care about being dignified. It is liberated from the shackles of the, this is how it's always been done. And it exhibits a freedom to explore the infinitely diverse ways that God expresses God's infinite self through all things and all bodies, no matter the race, the class, the sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, immigration status, religion, or physical or mental ability. And lastly, may I suggest that the kind of house that is needed is not just in the exquisite Gothic revival style of the physical building with its distinctive towers and Brooklyn Heights, but it is the house within that house, which is a place where all people are loved and fed a house where all people together creatively shape the community towards fulfilling and realizing the beloved community for all people. Oh, hear me when I say this, that you, First Church Brooklyn, that you, First Church Roseville, are a beautiful but peculiar people because you stand in a tradition of house makers and creators of spaces of sacred encounter. Those who believe that being a Christian means to do something different. Those who believe that being a Christian means to love. So in conclusion, just wanna offer this story. I, I recall when I first started 
performing poetry some 20 years ago. I had this feature set on a Friday night in downtown Hartford, my hometown. I knew my stuff, but I was a little nervous. At that time, I had stopped going to church and I was searching for a place of spiritual authenticity. The spoken word community was not only becoming a home to my spiritual journey, but I was finding my prophetic voice offering hope through my poems. So though I had a sense of calling that night, I was nervous. And so sometime after 11 p.m. when my name was called, I kind of slowly walked up to the stage, even with a little skittishness. And as I took a little bit too long kind of adjusting the mic stand, trying my best to hide my nervousness, trying, probably unsuccessfully, to silently kind of woo-ha into a sense of calm, I heard this sister right here in the front say to me, just loud enough, take your time, you're home now. That act of house making by that stranger enabled me to speak my truth with confidence in an encounter of sacred experiences. It was an encounter that empowered my calling such that I can credibly connect a through line from the house of God of that poetry stage long ago to the house of God that contains the very pulpit from which I stand. So what kind of house? You know, indeed, we are far, far away in time and space from that vast ancient throne room in Jerusalem in which King David asked his prophet Nathan about making a house for God. But in these perilous times, punctuated by the pervasiveness of a pandemic and the petulance of our politics, we can be in the living and transformative traditions practiced by those who come before us, true house makers, creators of sacred encounter for all those in need, as we seek to make real the kingdom of God that Jesus spoke of, a world that works for all people in a world where everyone is empowered to live into their calling. These kinds of houses remind us that God's grace is greater than the thorns within our society. They also let us to know that in the bulb, there remains a flower, something that only God can see. Oh, there's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody, and there's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. May this word find root in your soul and may it bloom forth as a blessing. And as you go, may you go with God and may you go in God's peace. Amen. First Church, we have been given every good gift for proclaiming God's presence and God's love to the world. And the world is thirsting for this good news. People struggle to believe that they are God's beloved. People hunger for words of hope and peace. And this is who we are. This is what our church does. We throw open the doors of God's house and take God's gospel message to the streets, to hungry neighbors, to the fields where migrant farm workers labor, to those who need to hear every Sunday that they are chosen, and I'm one of those people. As we have been blessed, we seek to be a blessing in God's name. Let us gather our gifts together now and bring them to God's work in the world as a show of our gratitude and praise. We can receive your financial offerings electronically this morning via PayPal or with a credit card at firstchurchbrooklyn.org. Scroll down and find the donate section. If you're watching on Facebook, you can donate at firstchurchbrooklyn.org as well. And if you like to give on your phone, text the word GIVE to 844-935-2770. As always, thank you for your gift.
Help us, faithful God, to see you in the needs that confront us daily. Help us to see you in those who are weak and lonely and hungry and afraid. Help us to live our Christian values of loving our neighbors like ourselves. And as we offer ourselves to those who need love, may we know that we are touching you. Amen. We believe deeply in the power of prayer. If you have joys or concerns that you would like to share with our community, please write your prayers in the chat box at fpc.church or on Facebook. Everyone will be able to see your prayers while the music plays, and in this way, we will be in prayer with and for one another. After this musical offering, I'll be back to offer a prayer for us all. <laughs> Loving God, we are grateful to be the people of God who come to prayer remembering that we do not have to twist the arm of a reluctant God to seek good things for this world, nor find ways to persuade a distant God to come near and listen to us. Thank you for good things and thank you for coming near to listen. We pray remembering that as we pray, we kneel alongside Jesus Christ in the presence of God our Creator with the help of the Holy Spirit. So we bring to mind now those people who are in need of our prayers, those who are ill or anxious, those who are lonely or sad, those who are despairing or defeated, those who are hungry or unhoused, those whose relationships are breaking apart, those who are bullied or abused, those who cannot find work, and those who are overworked. We pray for all those on our hearts and in our minds today. In the presence of God, alongside Jesus Christ, with help from the Holy Spirit, we trust your power, loving God, to send us into this week, living out our prayers through our lives. We trust in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, join me in continuing to pray for my brother Masia Evans, uh, his family and his congregation, and to thank him in your prayers for the word that he brought to our community today. I hope to see many of you on the Zoom talkback following worship. And at this time, I invite you to open your hands and open your hearts in expectation of God's blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God make the holy face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the holy countenance upon you and grant you peace from this day onward and unto forevermore. Another world is not only possible. Another world is not only possible. Another world is not only possible. She's on her on a quiet day.